So the goal here today is to explore what is humanistic inquiry and give it an engineering twist. So humanistic inquiry consists of these six questions. We're going to go through each of them one by one. Your goal is to write a paper answering these six questions and I'm going to give you my answers to them as we go through this. So our first question is, what does it mean to be human? Now we can answer that in many different ways, but from an engineering point of view, maybe we change that to the question, what future do you want to build? So suppose you want to build a car, but everybody believes you can't breathe when it goes faster than 60 miles per hour, which was wrong, but it stopped cars for a generation. So can you wait 20 years? Convincing people to change? It's pretty, pretty hard. We rarely touch dirt now. This is a picture of an air cleaner outside. Uh, the junk from the air turns into a black diamond that's attached to jewelry that's sold to try to help pay for it. But, I mean, the real question is, where are we heading? Containment domes over everything? Um, my generation basically feels that the human species is evolving another one, or we're evolving ourselves into a robot, we're encasing ourselves in an exoskeleton. It's pretty interesting. What does your generation believe? Okay, so here's another answer to that question, what does it mean to be human? Engineers are perceived as experts. This is a, a movie that was originally scripted or written in Russian by Russian engineers. And it's so true that it proves there's a worldwide fraternity of engineers. We start a new project for which we require seven red lines. I understand your company can help us in this matter. Of course. Walter here will be the project manager. Walter, we can do this, can't we? Yes, of course. Anderson here is our expert in all matters related to the drawing of red lines. We've brought him along today to share his uh, professional opinion. Nice to meet you. Well, you all know me. This is Justine, our company's design specialist. Hello. We need you to draw seven red lines, all of them strictly perpendicular. Some with green ink and some with transparent. Can you do that? No, I'm afraid... Let's not rush into any hasty answers, Anderson. Uh, the task has been set and needs to be carried out. At the end of the day, you are an expert. But you can listen to more of it if you get into the or the Google slide presentation of this lecture. Okay, so here's another answer to the question, what does it mean to be human? Um, you can see there's just one word up there at the top, customers, but basically what we're talking about is how you perceive the world as an engineer. I mean, clergy call all their parishioners their flock. Police look at everybody else and call them perps or perpetrators of crime. Soldiers look at everybody else and call them civilians. Doctors treat everybody as a patient, even if they're just trying to start a friendly conversation. Engineers feel that everybody is a customer. They're always asking you questions and thinking you're an expert. And you're not. You're basically a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, but they don't know that. They think all you do is fix things. So this is a story about an engineer that, called Dilbert who lacks some social skills, sort of like the Big Bang Theory. So is that what human, the human species is dividing into? People that drink soylent and people that are foodies? I don't know. Okay, so now we're answering the question, what does it mean to be human by saying who we are as an engineer? We have the knack. What does the knack mean? I'm worried about little Dilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Oh! The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh, dear. Is that bad? Normally, I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. It's worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? The knack. 
It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and utter social ineptitude. Can he lead a normal life? No. He'll be an engineer. <laughs> no! <laughs> there, there. Okay, so again, we're trying to answer this question, what does it mean to be human? Engineers are a very diverse group of personalities. They're outliers, typically, at least the ones that get all the notoriety. These are two videos describing those kinds of personalities. The one on the left, uh, he talks about a guy who eats each pea and talks to it. I was just reading a book over the weekend that described Freeman Dyson, one of the foremost mathematicians associated with quantum physics, doing that. In many professions, diversity is measured in terms of skin color, sex, orientation, or other unimportant metrics. But in engineering, we know that the real meaning to diversity is working with a very talented pool of freaks, weirdos, and social degenerates. For example, the guy who snores while he's listening to you. The guy who not only eats alone, but eats only a pile of peas, one at a time, quietly and mysteriously saying something to each and every one. I'm gonna eat you. You know, some days I get the feeling that we recruit from the Bob Newhart School of Social Awkwardness. But you know what? It's kind of a good thing. I mean, in some industries, companies can hire people based on their social significance, but not in engineering. We have to hire all of the talented people that we can. I mean, if the guy we hire can answer complex problems, but only wearing an aluminum foil Viking helmet? Welcome aboard, Olaf. So sometime today, why not walk up to the freakiest freak that you work with, put your arm around him and say, hey man, thank you for being you and not being me. The one on the right is about a lady who uh, designs cattle chutes and makes life pleasant for the cows when they die. I think I'll start out and just talk a little bit about what exactly autism is. Autism is a very big continuum that goes from very severe, the child remains nonverbal, all the way up to brilliant scientists and engineers. And I actually feel at home here because there's a lot of autism genetics here. When does a nerd turn into, you know, uh, Asperger, which is just mild autism? I mean, Einstein and Mozart and Tesla would all be probably diagnosed as uh, autistic spectrum today. And one of the things that really is going to concern me is getting these kids to to be the ones that are going to invent the next energy thing. I think in pictures. I don't think in language. The normal brain ignores the details. Well, if you're building a bridge, details are pretty important because I'll fall down if you ignore the details. Okay, in my work with cattle, I noticed a lot of little things that most people don't notice would make the cattle balk. Like, for example, this flag waving right in front of the veterinary facility. Okay. Photorealistic visual thinkers like me pattern thinkers, music and math minds. Some of these oftentimes have problems with reading. You also will see these kind of problems with um, kids that are um, dyslexic. You'll see these different kinds of minds. And then there's a verbal mind. They know every fact about everything. This ability to put information into categories, I find a lot of people are not very good at this. Like when I'm out troubleshooting with equipment or problems with something in a plant, they don't seem to be able to figure out, do I have a training people issue? or do I have something wrong with the equipment? In other words, categorize equipment problem from a people problem. See, my thinking's bottom up. I take all the little pieces and I put the pieces together like a puzzle. Now the thing is, the world is gonna need all of the different kinds of minds to work together. The next humanistic inquiry question is, is engineering also art? And we'll let these next two videos answer that question. Are you seriously going to compare the glorious, selfless calling of engineering with the bunko Bush League chicanery of art? Artists aren't tortured by V&V &V plans or spec reviews. They don't have to submit themselves to the accountability of a compiler. A canvas is never going to fail or crash structurally just because it's ugly. Oh, and you're not supposed to say ugly. It's supposed to be abstract. To get into computer college, I had to get good grades and score well on my SATs. Art school? Heck, if you've got the tuition and can draw a turtle on the back of a napkin, you're in. Then there's concept art, which we engineers can't stand. Let's say you're walking through a park and you see an oversized toilet on top of a pile of rutabagas, and you quietly mutter under your breath, what the hell is that? 
It's the same emotion I get when I see a CONCACAFs used to call an API that was never meant to be called by idiots, Carl. But maybe I'm being unfair. I mean, there are some interesting parallels between technology and art. Artists have graffiti, whereas we have open source software. The purpose of art is to elicit emotion. Can software do that? Sure. Just the other day, when I saw a go-to statement in the middle of my exception save callback, I almost screamed. Now, if there's one thing that strikes fear into the heart of all engineers, it's feature creep. Can artists understand feature creep? Absolutely. I guarantee that more than one of Salvador Dali's works was ruined by, oh, just one more melty clock. And of course, once you realize that you have one too many melty clocks, there's no SCC revert button. Artists, we too devote our lives to a labor of love. But of course, we have limits. You've never heard of a starving engineer before. So I guess maybe, just maybe, engineers and artists can get along. My name is Theo Janssen. I'm a kinetic sculptor. My sculptures are made of very light materials and they are powered by the wind. A part of me is an engineer who wants to map the progress of mobility. Another part is an artist who wants to sculpt the air that surrounds us and give it shape. All right, so a new question. What ideas, values create a more purposeful, ethical, richer life? Well, there's lots of books written about this by engineers, for engineers, describing the pleasures of engineering. Um, you can see one of them there. But what are my ideals and my values? I, I think the number one value is service. Serving the world, making it a better place. Not money, not power, not fame. Improving the world. Changing little things, one at a time. So many older people start with should be and then end up in the world's falling apart. They go into a depression. It's vanity. It's self-aggrandizement to think that we can even engineer the entire human species or the world or solve these huge political problems such as war. So focus on the little things. Just change what you can change. See if it sticks. Most of the time as an engineer you're working with other engineers and you speak persuasively and think creatively and read actively for them. And you're going to learn how to do that through presentations in this course. But what I want to talk about is the rest of the world. The rest of the world doesn't want to change. But modern civil engineers often get stuck talking to NIMBYs. They're the local homeowners that don't want to change. They don't want the new road. They don't want the new development. And so they're going to argue with the traffic engineers. If you talk to those engineers, they get stuck in these NIMBY meetings all the time. The politicians run away and hide and make the engineers do all the dirty work that they're supposed to do. This is really quite shocking to many engineers. Okay, so the next question is how do I evaluate problems from multiple perspectives? Now engineers, their perspectives are these stakeholders, these seven stakeholders. Starts off with the public, laws and standards, profession, client, firm, others, and yourself. So if there's a conflict between killing the public and violating a law, Obviously, as an engineer, you choose the public. So there's a hierarchy here. And at the very bottom is yourself. Engineers work from project to project. And if they don't get on another project within the firm, then they'll get fired. So you're always, as an engineer, trying to find different projects to get on. And this stakeholder perspective, the most important thing to understand is that everything below the public are engineers. But stakeholders are used then to understand problem areas and each of these problem areas has a different kind of perspective. At the individual level you're trying to avoid deceptive acts. 
these stakeholders you need to memorize. We're going to be using them over and over again, particularly when we get into engineering ethics. Okay, so the last humanistic inquiry question is, is how are Google Docs and wikis changing the dissemination of knowledge? These shared documents are richer than anything you can produce out of your own fingers and your own mind. You should never try to write without somebody else editing it. And when you read, you should never read without editing the document as you read it. This is going to be a rule in this class. If you read something, edit it. Make it better. In whatever way you feel makes it better. Be an engineer at all times. So now your next step is to go through these, these six questions and answer them in your own way. Not my way, just in your way. Good luck.